Assalamu alaikum and greetings. My name is Shwa and I am the host and founder of a podcast called Light Up with Shwa. It's a weekly podcast on conscious living and parenting. I hope you have already subscribed to my podcast and if you haven't please do so. I am sure you will find some some guest or some question or one of the episodes that interests you. It's on conscious living and parenting and I'm sure it touches someone somewhere who i have fascinating uh, guests from all over i can now claim they are ri- literally all over international and national so i am sitting in massachusetts and i have a very special guest all the way in nottingham uk uh, she is an author of a amazing book we will talk about that and uh, here we have selena for all the listeners please welcome selena And Selina, welcome to our podcast. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Um yes, it's please, uh, lovely to be here. Thank yes. you. And please uh, introduce yourself with your full name and what do you do? Uh yes, uh, my name is Selina Karim um and uh I'm a part-time writer I should say, uh a sporadic one, but uh, yes, I'm an uh, author of a book uh, best known as Secular Jinnah. Mm, okay. And uh, you have a novel too, right? You have uh, talk about that. Uh, mm-hmm. So, how many books in total? If you count the secular jinnas, technically there are two, okay. um, and then there's the novel, which is a third. Okay. But actually, they are two titles. Okay. But there are two distinct titles. Okay. So, Systems is my novel, and Secular Jinnah is my non-fiction work. Okay. All right. So, let's begin with your book first and uh, then we'll come to the parenting questions and some thought-provoking questions and let's uh, pick your brains here because you're the author. Uh, so, uh, what made you write uh, Secular Jinnah in Pakistan? Uh, that's a good question. Um, well, the the aim was actually to write an article. Hmm. Um, I had no intention at all of writing a book. Uh hmm. What happened was I was translating uh, a pamphlet. Mm-hmm. It was a um uh, a discussion of is uh, Gandhi Azam's vision for Pakistan secular or non-secular or what, what one one would say is Islamic. And uh, in the in the course of translating that pamphlet, uh, I had to get hold of Chief Justice Munir's very famous book from Jinnah Tazia. Um and I was flicking through that book and this quote came up um and um the words were very interesting to me and I wanted to know the context of those words and so I actually went off initially just to find out the context of the words uh and what I quickly discovered is that this quote is nowhere to be found I couldn't find it anywhere and I was thinking why and the dates were all wrong and <laughs> it took me about I think a month to find it and when it turned up the actual correct interview the words were essentially nothing alike they were very very different um and what came out of that was that this quote despite it not being covered in that pamphlet that it is a very um it's a very powerful it cre- it creates a very powerful argument um that makes it seem almost impossible to accept any other argument for the pakistan idea other than a so-called secular one or a irreligious one or a liberal one how one would depending on one's point of view what would one would call it which is you know secular which is usually known as secular and that's the, that was supposed to be an article and then it turned into a book and then it turned into two books and then a second edition of the second book so it's been going on and on for a while and uh, yeah i i had no idea it was going to do what it did it is uh, just turned into its own monster really <laughs> it's uh, yeah taken me in all sorts of directions so it's very interesting so uh, could you share if you uh, are willing to uh, what is the response to the book those who have read it uh well as um, i'm sure you know most pakistanis who are interested in this question know it's a very heated debate it's a very argumentative debate it there is nothing uh, close to objectivity on anybody's side there's it's all you know passion heat um so equally the responses i got were ecstatically happy to um 
extremely angry. I've seen, uh, you know, I've seen both ends. Um, hmm. uh, the the so-called secular writers, they didn't like it. Um, and um, many of the so-called ideologues did like it. Um, and uh, actually, when I did produce, or sorry, publish the first book, um, that 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 argument, the, the, the intensity of that argument really became clear to me in a way, because I didn't know anything before when I had started. I had no idea, really. I kind of learned as I went. What so, about uh, uh, the idea of uh, that this was said or Jinnah was secular or which? Uh, no, I, I was aware of that. Mm -hmm. uh, what I wasn't aware of is just how hot and bothered people get oh, about it. I'm, okay. uh, you know, I'm, I'm from a country where we kind of, well, Brits are not always laid back, but they are very good at kind of keeping cool heads about things. Mm. If they're going to have a discussion, even if they're passionate about it, uh, we have entire TV shows, you know, where we have quite cool headed people very rationally discussing things. Um, and even when they disagree, they'll find a way to kind of keep things in a, to a degree civil. Mm. Um, but this, this, so when I kind of experienced this fire, <laughs> mm. I was very, very blown away. Mm. And I, I, I was more, more than anything else, I was kind of curious to know why that is and how that had come to pass. Mm -hmm. So that's what kind of led me to this investigation. And, and the thing is, the argument as I presented it was slightly different from both the standard uh, right wing and the standard left wing mm -hmm. argument. So uh, some would say, well, it's kind of in the middle, but it's not the middle that and there is a middle uh, argument, and it's not even that middle argument. It's slightly different even the middle argument. So I've said that there are four categories of thought, if you broadly speak. And there are always a million shades of grey, but it's those are the main four. So you've got the conservative right-wing opinion. You've got the far-left opinion. You've got the so-called synthesis argument, which is a combination of secularism and Islam. And then you've got this fourth as yet undefined category, um, which um, Iqbal, for instance, belonged to. Uh, 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 the late Dr. Javed Iqbal, uh, he described that position as reconstructionist. Uh, and I, you know, I came to know that a bit later. So I, I said, uh, well, I had called it non-sectarian by this point, um, but it's the same one. Okay. Um, it's, it's this kind of not synthesis, not one specific group that already exists. It's kind of an, another one um, which comes closest to the spirit of uh, Islam as uh, I think Iqbal saw it anyway. So mm. what's happened is we've got a modern West that has come out of the, the movement of secularism. Secularism as a concept was just literally to stop Catholics and Protestants arguing and fighting and killing each other over everything. That was mm. in a nutshell what, what history was about and uh, for you know to bring secularism to the fore hmm. um, but that idea it doesn't quite work in our culture where we we are both Muslims and Hindus in fact both believe in their religions as ways of life um, and they appreciate in a very real sense that even if we really do talk about secularism in principle in reality our uh, religious ideals are going to touch on everything mm -hmm. uh, so when we talk about secularism in Pakistan for instance what Pakistani secularists tend to mean with the exception of the far left they tend to mean we are literally going to just have equality in the in the in the state so we're not going to discriminate against any minority we're not going to say this these these people uh, have to pay jizya in an islamic state or or uh, this this community is out of islam you know we're, we're just going to separate that from the working of the government um, and in a way it's kind of a reboot back to the original concept of secularism and that's what Pakistanis are inspired by on the left um but unfortunately, for those who are opposed to secularism, they, they're looking at things as they are in the present. And they see a West where there's a lot of people who are uh, confused about, you know, what life means in a post-secular world, if you like, a, a materialist world. So they, um, 
they're kind of trying to say, well, you know, the secularism isn't going to work for us. And, uh, and of, of course, being religious people, they kind of fear uh, a divorce of religion and state uh, being basically blasphemous as well. So um, it's a very complicated affair in Pakistan uh, to talk about secularism. Um, and this was something I, I had to tackle very carefully um, in my book. So do you think it is because they don't know exactly the definition or do they tend to believe that whatever, whether it is real or distorted or that's what it is, you know, is, uh, no, get, actually, is it a refusal uh, of understanding or what is it? Yeah, no, this is this is what I mean. There's the, so the left are talking about the version, the ideal version, if you like, of equality. Oh. Um, the the ideal being that you know we will have no more discrimination well and the and the right are kind of saying well secularism brings about moral decadence it brings about uh, confusion for society you know there's going to be no cohesion there's going to be no absolutism in moral principles and we're going to get guided the wrong way or misguided hmm. uh, so they both have clear views both sides it's just that they have very opposing views of what that word means. Mm -hmm. um, and to my to my understanding, it secularism, if you like, is an ideal that doesn't exist anywhere in reality. And that's why we have seen it play out the way that it has in the West, mm -hmm. where we now have people looking for spirituality, but they know the trappings of their organized religions. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of looking to uh, mysticism as one example. I know that America is uh, yes. quite on uh, Molana Rumi, for instance. Yes. So um, th those are the outcomes of um, moving to a purely secular state. The, li the left will kind of say, well, actually, you know what, that's better than what we have now. And the right will say, no, this is a disaster. We want to avoid this confusion at all costs. And that's, that's what I understand, mm. uh, having gone through it for a few years. Okay, okay. Um, let's talk about um, Munir Court from where uh, that's to your research and that's where you found out that it was misquoted, uh, m uh, Justice Munir uh, misquoted or misinterpreted. Well, you will explain it. Yeah. So, the um, okay, the Munir quote is a quote that has been used for many years uh, by various uh, scholars and uh, all kinds of writers. It's a quote that's being used to try and um, reveal to uh, ordinary readers what vision Jinnah had for Pakistan. Um, and the quote itself is problematic because it's a misquote. Um, and of course, in history, there are so many uh, instances of misquotes and uh, occasionally fake quotes. But what makes this one very special is that it uh, it it has been it has become a central part of an argument for a so-called secular jinnah. Um, and when you see the quote lined up against the correct quote, you can see how and why there is a problem with using the misquote. So, uh, so before I... uh, we, uh, I, just to make it clear for the listeners, uh, uh -huh. so the quote is uh, Kaidi Azam's quote, right? Uh, jinnah's yes. quote that uh -huh. Miss. Uh, Justice Munir has misquoted. That's so correct. to just yes. to reiterate it. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Now, uh, yes, uh, Justice Munir uh, originally uh, produced this quote in his 1950 report on uh, the Amdi uh, riots that had happened in Lahore in 1953. Um, and he brought in this quote. Um, and actually, at the time, it was paraphrased. But uh, since that time, it has become uh, treated as a verbatim quote, so a word by word quote. So if I give you the, the words, then it'll kind of make more sense. Sure, um, please. So the, the, the misquote, in which I now call the Manir quote, uh, uses two phrases together. Uh, and the first part of it is sovereignty resting in the people. And the other one is modern democratic state. So um, whilst Certainly, sovereignty resting in the people may or may not, uh, for instance, be problematic for the right wing commentary. Um, 
That combination with modern democratic state immediately makes it problematic for the right wing. Um, and for the left wing, it bolsters this idea that um, uh, Jinnah was definitely somebody who envisioned a secular polity for Pakistan. So uh, I'll deal with those two parts uh, to show why what makes them incorrect. So sovereignty resting in the people is a phrase that in the first place, Jinnah never used it. Mm. Uh, except once, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, it's actually being used incorrectly in the quotes that it, it appears in. Um, it's being used to imply a state which separates religion from uh, the, the machinery of the state. Um, and in fact, that's a romantic, uh, sentimental kind of way of phrasing it. And it's and Jinnah was known for knowing being very exact very logical, very cool-headed, precise with his language. He never, ever messed about with his words, as is well known. So uh, where it says sovereignty resting in the people, actually Jinnah said uh, popular representative in the real quote. He never said sovereignty in the people. The only time he has, I, to my knowledge, used the phrase sovereignty of the people is in its correct constitutional technical term, uh, which is, uh, in its, sorry, in its technical sense, which is to mean uh, the right of self-determination. And that's the way he used it. And he only used it once, as far as I know. Um, and then the other half of it is modern democratic state. Uh, and that's very, very interesting because that in the subcontinent, especially in that uh, British Raj era, it was banded about a lot. It was uh, used at expressly to mean a Western secular state, you know, a contemporary, modern meaning contemporary state. Um, and um, while it was used by the Congress, the or the Indian National Congress, um, it was never, and it was used by Nehru as well, actually, uh, the leader of the, uh, the, the uh, Congress, uh, but it was never used by Jinnah. Uh, and in fact, maybe twice he's been caught on record as having said, a modern democratic state would not work for India. So uh, Jinnah never ever used it to describe his vision for Pakistan. Uh, and the one time or two times he used it to describe India, he said it wasn't suitable uh, for reasons that he did give at the time. He said that that concept of, you know, rule of uh, majority, the brutal majority is not going to work in, in a place that is as complicated as a subcontinent, which is, you know, it's comprised of many nations, not just one or two. It's actually quite several nations. And you cannot introduce a single state type of modern democratic state here. Yeah, uh, I was talking about the subcontinent. Yes. So this this concept didn't apply in his view to the mm -hmm. subcontinent. So he uh, he didn't use the term modern democratic state ever. Uh, however, when it came to Pakistan, he did use a different phrase. Um, it was uh, and and in the real quote that I managed to dig up, the in the real quote the the you know the equivalent of modern democratic state is democratic form. Now. You know, it, it doesn't take a constitutionalist. It doesn't take any sort of expertise to kind of see that there's a distinct difference between saying modern democratic state and democratic form. The one is specific, especially in view of how the subcontinent was using it. It's very specific and it's uh, re relating specifically to a form, whereas saying democratic form is placing the emphasis on the principle. So it's a democratic principle. And the few times that um, Mr. Jinnah did talk about a form, he tended to say either Islamic democracy or Islamic social uh, socialism. So um, that's the reason that there is such a chasm of a difference between using the Munir quote and the real quote, which was actually uh, the Reuters uh, interview with Dune Campbell in uh, May 1947. That's what I wanted um, you to do, give the reference. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Mr. When Mr. Munir quoted it in his report, he only supplied the year, uh, and it was the wrong year, and it was 1946, and he said it was Dune Campbell, and that was the only clue I had to go on. So I, when I went and looked for it, I had to look for Dune Campbell and Reuters uh, and 1946, and it turned out it was 1947, and it turned out that since there was only ever one interview with Dune Campbell, he, Dune Campbell himself mentions it in his own memoir, that it was the only time he interviewed Dune, and it was a big deal for him. Um, and um, yeah, so th that turned out it was 1947, and then I could see that there there is an extremely vague, slight uh, connection between the two, and that is in the form of two words. 
there were only two words in common, cast and creed, and that was it. There was nothing else in there that is, you know, identical uh, to kind of match these two um, quotes up. So that that is the, you know, the quote, uh, what, what's wrong with the quote in a nutshell. And in fact, uh, there is more to it than that, and I go into it uh, in, in, in the book, which is that um, this, without the Muneer quote, the secular so-called argument has a very weak uh, basis. It's, it, the 11th August speech, 1947, it's kind of claimed by all sides. Um, but it's only when you use that quote in combination that it has real power. So, yeah, that's it. That's it. Thank you so much. Justice Munir, was he a Muslim? Oh, yes. Apparently? Yes. I was. Okay. yes. Uh, okay. In fact, um, according to uh, one or two of his um, defenders, he wrote positively in favor of Islam uh, at various points. And, uh, you know, the... Uh, the um, the positives of uh, Sharia canons. Um, but really, when you consider that his last book from Jannah was literally the last book he wrote before he died, in that he's so utterly critical, hmm. it's hard to kind of say, well, you know, to accept that this is, it's, it's like the last word, it's his final testimony, isn't it? So hmm. uh, to me, that kind of is irrelevant to kind hmm. of bring that in, even hmm. though, yes, he, he considered himself a believing uh, Muslim, yes. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, so um, yeah, he when he quoted it the first time in the Manu report, there were no quotes. It was paraphrased. Mm. It was not explicitly said that it's paraphrased, but it's clear that it was paraphrased. Mm. Um, and about five minutes after this quote first emerged, the secular lobby of Pakistan basically got hold of it and ran with it. Because it was the first time this quote had ever appeared. No one had ever seen it before. Mm. Before that, the only quote that used to be used to defend a secular polity for Pakistan was the 11th August 1947 speech of Qadiyazm, which is the first speech that he gave to the Constituent Assembly of Pakistan in 1947. Um, and uh, we all we all know the um, the speech that he gave there. That that too. Uh, has been disputed heavily, but at least in that one's case, the left and the right generally both are happy to talk about that particular speech. So things like, for instance, in the Minute Report, he says things like, um, well, you know, we've brought up uh, Gaidi Azam's views of the state not to challenge anybody, but just to kind of bring it into discussion. Uh, we, ha- we are not making any comments. And in this book, he explicitly brings in the quote just to make that comment. And he even says that he's doing it to kind of prove that this is how Pakistan ought to be. And he himself, at this point, has forgotten that this was paraphrased. So he's putting it in quotes and treating it oh. as a real quote. So he, while he is guilty of doing the same thing, it's, if you like, the people whose job it is to check the evidence is their fault for not checking for 50 years. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so when it landed on my lap, I was really, really, really surprised. <laughs> um, you know, oh, my goodness. I, I remember, um, if you don't mind, the personal anecdote. Yes, yes, I would I, love I, I, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I remember going and um, running into, the, <laughs> into my living room and uh, saying to dad you are never going to believe this but that quote that we've been looking at it's a fake <laughs> and he was he was shocked and he said to me you know he said you have to write about this and I said nah it's just a fake quote it's just really interesting isn't it and he says no Selena, it's more than interesting you have to write about it so I thought oh well you know I don't know much about the Pakistan story but I'll I'll just write an article about this quote and I'll just stick to the facts because I'm I'm very um, particular about this I don't like to go outside subjects that I'm not very clued up on um, so I started the article and uh, before I knew it this article was 10 pages and after that it got silly and I thought this isn't going to work unless it's a book um, and then it became a, I think a 170 odd page book which was called Secular Jinnah and it had a really the embarrassing title which I won't quote the rest of um, and uh, is now known fondly as SJ1 but uh, that book um, has been described as explosive and all kinds of things um, some of the some of the comments are very nice people really liked it um, but after that I kind of you know after me- meeting the 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 hot-headed personalities that I did 
uh, after that, I kind of got more interested in why the argument has gone the way that it has and what went wrong and why it went wrong. And I just kind of dealt with it in a more, mm. um, if you like, cool and objective manner, or I have tried to, certainly. So, um, yeah, that's that's the story of my my book in a nutshell. Very interesting. So, yes, uh, yeah. it's... It, it is um, it's one of those things that it's very hard for people to stay cool-headed about, unfortunately. And I think mm. part of that is just down to the fact that um, anyone arguing for a Muslim jinnah, if you talk about a secular jinnah and a Muslim jinnah, mm -hmm. um, anyone who argues for a Muslim jinnah is automatically treated with suspicion um, just simply because we're in an age of Islamophobia mm. in general, unfortunately. So uh, that kind of has a major plays a major hand in uh, creating this um, backlash for anyone who would argue for a second. Uh, sorry, for a, for a Muslim jinnah. Mm. Um, I certainly experienced it, um, um, and I chose to ignore it and just deal with it within the pages of my book. So I mm. haven't talked about it in uh, in any capacity outside of any mm. um, anything that I've written. I think today is probably the first time that I'm talking about it, actually. Um, so before today, I didn't talk about it uh, at all. So, uh, yeah. Thank you for doing that. Um, so, so you haven't talked about your book outside your book. That's what you're saying, right? Generally speaking, no. Uh, yeah. um, so I've, I've mentioned it at my blog, but that's about it. Yeah. What heat did you get? Uh, what kind of uh, like? I'm trying to still understand uh, uh, if well, if you want to share. I mean, it's nothing. Uh,